Good morning. It is good to see everybody this morning. I'm so glad you've chosen to join us on this Palm Sunday. It is a glorious day, and in such a, a, as, as we have, uh, the weather is going to be absolutely beautiful this afternoon for our uh, kids' egg extravaganza thing. Um, I let everybody know that I double-checked, and you are allowed to have fun even if you're not a kid. <laughs> so you are free to come out and enjoy a beautiful day uh, with, uh, with your uh, fellow sisters and brothers in the church and uh, just have some, have some joyous time together today. Uh, that, that starts at 2. It's from 2 to 4. Kids are going to be running everywhere, and it'll be great. We'd, we'd love to see it. So, uh, Also, this Thursday at 6 p.m. will be our uh, Maundy Thursday service. Uh, we'll have communion, a uh, short sermon, and uh, just a time of remembrance and prayer of uh, that special day. Um, by way, uh, those are all the announcements I have, I believe. So let us prepare our hearts and minds as we go to the Lord in worship. Very grateful to our children and their workers and parents for helping us to have the children involved in our service this morning. They've already uh, been in the early service and remained for this one. And we're, we're always look forward to, to this on Palm Sunday. Thank you, young people. You know, children love to hear stories. But for the child of God at any age, uh, stories of Jesus, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his promised return to take us to heaven are always fresh and exciting. They never grow old. Textually, hymn number 277 pictures very vividly the important events of Christ's life from Galilee to Calvary. Please join us as we sing together, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus, hymn number 277, and may we stand together, please. Tell me the stories of Jesus, I love to hear. Things I would ask you to tell me, they were here. Sing by the wayside, tales of the sea. Sir, 
please remain standing and join with me as we affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed, found on 881 in your hymnals. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended in heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated and we prepare our hearts to turn to our Lord in prayer, I would like to invite you to, uh, to see and, and thank Carolyn uh, Sockwell for putting up the Stations of the Cross on the walls. Uh, we have a uh, prayer uh, guide on the back table. Feel free to come by any time this week uh, when the office is open and you can uh, walk through and pray the Stations of the Cross and uh, um, use that as a time, especially during this Holy Week, uh, to, prepare, to prepare yourself for the glory of Easter. Let us now turn to the Lord of Grace in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we come to you today shouting, Hosanna, save us. Save us from ourselves, save us from oppression, save us from what comes at us from the exterior, save us from the difficulties that come at us from within. Lord, give us the strength to resist temptation. Lord, give us the strength to choose obedience, sticking to your will, removing ourself from the equation, making our first priority that everyone on this planet may know that they are loved because we know we are loved by you. Help us, Lord, be such a channel of your peace into this world that our very presence elicits peace in others around us. Let us be that conduit of your love so that everyone knows that we care for who you are. Lord, help us be those who carry from this place not a sense of what is right and wrong, but a sense of how we may serve for the sake that all may come to know you. We bring all of this to you, lay it upon the altar, and offer ourselves as living sacrifices. Use our lives as you would. Put us to your work in your way and help us to know you in all that we do. We ask all of this in Christ Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, through art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we for those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now the word of our Lord through his holy prophet. And now on the first day of the week, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Do this, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I do not throw open the gates of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you that cannot be numbered. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we are so grateful for all that you have given us to, to live in such a life of abundance. Help us, Lord, to live 
according to your way with the resources that you have given us so that we may draw nearer to you and so that we may indeed be the source of grace and help and love in this world. We ask all of this in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ Yeah.
Our scripture lesson today comes from John 13, verses 31 through 35. Hear now the word of God. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so I say now to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This week we wrap up our series on the characteristics that, that we want to, to see in a mature disciple, a mature follower of Jesus Christ. The, the characteristics that we, we want to build into our church system that we help grow in all of us, and they, they don't necessarily sound like what we've been used to which is probably a good thing because we started this whole series with the idea or actually the, the, the study on how we found out that the longer that people are in church, the less they are engaged in spiritual disciplines, the less they see them as important and the less they, they experience them as life transforming. We have to do something differently about how we raise up disciples. I think this is a, a new framework for us to look at. We began with talking about being with God before doing for God. I am an action-oriented, hands-on kind of person. I love that kind of stuff. And uh, because I was insane and decided to get in a very uh, cerebral job where I spend a lot of my time doing everything up here, which I also really enjoy, I have to be extremely intentional about putting my hands to work so that I don't just try to find things to do and substitute that for being just present with God. We can do that. We can think that sometimes just a, a busying ourselves and filling up our schedule with stuff to do for God is the same as being with God, but that is simply not the case. We've discovered that when we make being with God, being immersed in the presence of God, our primary practice, the most important thing we do every day, 
immersing ourselves in that presence, then our doing for God is, in fact, doing for God. It is Holy Spirit-driven because we have been immersed and surrounded by the Holy Spirit. We then talked about following the crucified Jesus, and we were specific about the crucified Christ because we, we discovered that people love to use Jesus as their mascot for whatever they think. They, they love to have an ideology. They love to have a political party. They love to have, uh, honestly, they'll, they'll have a business, and they'll use Jesus as their, as their little mascot, like one of those sock things that are blowing around out there, you know? Jesus has been Americanized, democratized, capitalized, and every other eyes across this planet. And I don't want to know any of those Jesuses because those aren't the Jesus of Nazareth. I want to know the crucified Jesus. The crucified Jesus who gave himself up. The crucified Jesus who refuses to dominate or coerce or overpower the crucified Jesus who knows that the only way to be in this world is to be a servant of one another. We learned a little bit about breaking the patterns of, of harmful uh, uh, family experiences in our past. We learned that families can, can be great. Uh, and they can give us wonderful upbringings and foundations, but sometimes in those foundations there's uh, a, a couple of bricks that are starting to deteriorate because they weren't so, you know, healthy. Uh, it, it, and it's not that our parents were bad parents. It's just that, honestly, we're all human, so we make mistakes. So, you know, and your parents didn't know that one thing they said or one thing they did was going to have that kind of a profound effect on you. It was just... A perfect storm. And so we can develop toxic habits even in good families. But we also learned that we can grow out of those patterns, of those unhealthy and toxic patterns, while still maintaining all of the wonderful things that our families have instilled in us. And then last week, we talked about being real, being authentic, being vulnerable, and how in fact, it's our faults and our vulnerabilities that make us especially effective in ministry. Not just my own ministry, but everyone who has simply shared of themselves, their heart, their own struggles, and how Jesus has spoken into that. That is how we reach people for Jesus. Today we're going to talk about the final and probably the most important of all of the characteristics of a mature disciple because it's the easiest for us to measure, at least with ourselves. A mature disciple is always increasing in love for others, period. The most obvious trait of Christian maturity is a growing love for others. Now, Joe, shouldn't we be loving God first? Well, we already covered the be, be with God. And as a matter of fact, Jesus would even say the same thing. He would, he would say that, uh, yeah, at, at, yes, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And he could have stopped there because... The, the Pharisees and the scribes, they only asked him what the greatest commandment was. He, they just wanted one. And then Jesus decides, actually, you can't separate the two. Because if you do one and not the other, then you're not actually doing one. And so he had to include the second that is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love one another. This is how they will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. I've heard a pastor uh, say that uh, Jesus is being very specific here, and he's saying you only have to love people within the church. And he's wrong. Um, I, you know, sorry. But he's completely and utterly wrong. <laughs> that is absolutely not true. Because if the only people we had to love were in the church, then we are all doomed. Because Jesus did not love 
only people in the church. Instead, he said, no, no, when you walk out, everyone out there, they're all objects of love. I love them, therefore you shall love them. You cannot separate loving God with everything and loving neighbor. Because God created each and every one of us in his own divine image. And we've discussed time and time and time again how some people are absolute professionals at hiding or distorting that divine image as good as humanly possible, but it's still in there. And so literally when you look into the eyes of another human being, I don't care if they're screaming their head off at you, they're still a reflection of Jesus Christ himself. Can you see in the eyes of someone that may even hate you a flicker of Jesus hiding back there somewhere? Why are we supposed to love something like that? What in the world? How are we supposed to do that without just being doormats? How are we supposed to go out into this world and love people who would hate us? Well, the first thing we need to understand is the world thinks we hate them. It's, it's proven there's been a large study. I told you about the, uh, the, the three uh, adjectives that uh, people outside the church would describe, would use to describe the church. And the first one is judgmental. The people, Christians, are judgmental. They already think we hate them. Because apparently at some point in time, this Jesus idea, this guy who went around not pointing out the sin of every single human being, but instead loving people into relationship with one another, we decided that we had the answers and we needed to go out into the world and tell people how to live right. Well, there's a problem here. The problem is, is that I, I remember learning from Billy Graham. I remember learning something from Billy Graham where he was very, very clear. He said, it is not my job to do anything but love. He said, it is the Father's job to judge, Jesus' job to save, and the Holy Spirit's job to convict and grow. It is my job to love. This is really surprising to me sometimes, that, that the number one trait of Christians is, is being judgmental to non-Christians. Because when I read scripture, it is pretty darn often when Jesus told us to pay a whole lot more attention to our own dirty laundry than to anyone else's. Am I wrong? No. He said, uh, you might want to pay a little less attention to the splinter in their eye than that giant two-by-four that's sticking out of your own. He says, nah, mm, let those without sin cast the first stone. He says, eh, you're, you're piling up weight on the shoulders of others that you yourself are unwilling to carry. Maybe you need to focus on yourself. Jesus spent time and time and time again telling us if you know the right answers, do them yourself. People will follow. People will pick up. He says, if you're done with that, then may maybe you haven't gotten all the right answers. I have yet to find the end of the rainbow on this particular path. The more I discover that I have fallen short, the more I discover that I fall short. It's kind of like one of those things when you, when you continue in school, you, all you do is you learn how much you don't know. It's the same thing. It, I, just, I just learn more and more and more, and I'm convicted of more and more and more, and I have no lack of things that I need to work on that the Holy Spirit needs to work on within me. So I know I don't have the time to focus on anyone else. 
Now, if someone comes to me and says, Joe, I'm really struggling with this. How do you think I can get over that? Now, hey, I was struggling with something similar. Here's, here's how Jesus kind of helped me out of that. That's not judgmental. That's helping someone who has come to you for help. But ask me, uh, uh, tell me, would, would any of us really listen to someone who just walked into our life, we didn't know them, and just start telling us everything we did wrong? Are you, are you particularly apt to listen to a person like that? Because I know many of you folks, and, and at least 99% of you are stubborn as all get out. So I am pretty sure that no human being on the planet could walk into your life and tell you everything you were doing wrong that you didn't know from anybody, and you would actually listen to them. I wouldn't listen to anybody like that. No, that person has to love me first. No, that person has to be on an equal footing with me. That person has to absolutely show me that they too struggle and are broken. So how do we love this world around us? It's so easy, just, just go out and love, right? But then, then there's other people here. There are people like Auburn fans there is this place in North Carolina called Chapel Hill, which is just the worst. And anyone that ever goes or looks at or drives through or wears that disgusting shade of blue deserves all the wrath of God on the planet. And yet I'm supposed to love those people? I'm, I'm bitter. But God... God didn't just tell us to love. He gave us a perfect example of it. When Jesus Christ, when God became incarnate, literally to, to put flesh onto, God is love. Jesus is literally the enfleshment, the embodiment, the walking, talking example of perfect love. And then he said, you are the body of Christ. You are now the enfleshment of love in the world. Now, when we incarnate love, we do so in the way of Christ. Who, as Paul said, though being able to equate himself with God, did not see Equality with God is something to be grasped, but instead emptied himself for the sake of others. Being obedient, even unto death, even death on a cross. A beautiful Christological song of Paul saying, he sacrificed his self, his will, so that others may know love. Now, this doesn't mean being a doormat. It doesn't mean not being able to say no. And it doesn't mean just being pulled this way and that way across all the earth by everyone else. It means being able to submit your own judgment to the fact that God has called you to love this world into salvation. Because love is the only thing that has transformed this world. Jesus did not come to convince us of the rightness of God. Jesus came to love and serve. And in that loving and serving, we have been saved. Jesus rejected power. Jesus chose to step down from the throne of God. Jesus chose to enter into the fallen, broken, limited fleshment of humanity. He did not come as one who had something wonderful to say. He came as a servant. He refused the power differentials between himself and others. Whether they be moral or intellectual or societal, he was not someone who was sitting around saying, I just simply want to be the person that teaches you what's right and what's wrong. Because that opens us up to being able to judge others. 
And, and judgment has this really messed up back end to it. Because we, sure, we can judge something, but then usually what happens is we judge something and then we say, but our understanding of that thing is morally superior to yours. Right? We don't ever judge something as, oh no, you, you got us. You totally got us. I will, you will never hear me say that the University of North Carolina is better. Ever. Ever. Because Duke is morally superior. Period. That's the gospel. It's in the Bible somewhere. <laughs> no, we, when we judge, we think we have some kind of leg up on another. God rejected this entirely. Jesus stepped out of heaven and took on, literally put meat on love itself. And he gathered with those who did not know love from the world around them. We are called to embody love, to put some flesh to it, to make it walk, to make it talk. And then the, the third thing that Jesus does when he incarnates love and how he is calling us to incarnate love is to see the person. Not the deeds, not the thoughts, not the beliefs, not the group they belong to, not even the hate in their eyes, but to see the person. Because when we see the person in front of us, when we truly see the person in front of us, we may just be able to dig through some of that exterior gruffness and see the flicker, the small spark, the barely burning ember of the image of God in which they were made by the same God who created and loved you. For the longest time we thought as Christians that all we had to do was convince someone that the Bible was, was worthy of being believed and that God was real. They had apologetics classes in some churches. Ever, anybody ever went or gone to, uh, read one of those books or gone to one of those classes? They taught you how to convince others of Jesus Christ. Well, I've not met another Christian who ever came to Jesus Christ because they lost an argument. I've met tons of Christians who came to Jesus Christ because someone somewhere did something small and insignificant in their minds, but it made all the world's difference because it was just the smallest act of love and kindness when they needed it. And that, that was the hole through which the Holy Spirit could soften a heart, could prepare, could convict, and convince, and convert. Martin Luther King once said, we must rediscover the redemptive power of love. Love is what has redeemed us. Love. It was only love that kept Christ on a cross. Only love. It was only love that allowed Christ to choose his Father's will and not his own. It was only love that led God to exit heaven and enter humanness with all of its brokenness. It is only love that will transform this community, this church, and this world. Period. Going outside and, and saying, you know, what's right and what's wrong is going to convince nobody of nothing until you've loved them. Until they know you care. Until you've entered into their life and invested in them. It doesn't matter what person you see standing before you. I don't care what you believe about this ideology or that. I don't, I don't care what politics you have. I don't, I don't care about any of this. Because Jesus called you to love somebody. Bob Dylan called us to love somebody. It may be the devil. No, 
Seriously, y'all are Dylan's generation. You should be able to catch up on this one. The power of love is redemptive. This is how the pews get filled. Now, we can fill the pews by me sitting up here and telling you all what's right and what's wrong. As long as all the people that we gather believe the same thing, we'll be okay. But I don't want to know what's right and what's wrong. I want to know Jesus. Bishop Michael Curry is the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church in America. And he, uh, he w- preached at Harry and Megan's royal wedding. He has a book called The, the Love is the Way, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful piece. If you ever re- want to just read a great theological work, it's very accessible. It's not, you know, high theology or anything, but it's a simple and great theological work of love. And he really summed up so much of it in the tail end of his address. And when you think about the people who were gathered in Westminster that day and how he very clearly just spoke of what it looks like when love rules, you know just how powerfully prophetic he was being. But I think it speaks to us today as well. Because we must understand that the redemptive power of love is more powerful than anything this planet has. So I share with you from from Bishop Curry. Imagine our homes and our families where love is the way. Imagine neighborhoods and communities where love is the way. Imagine governments and nations where love is the way. Imagine business and commerce where love is the way. Imagine this tired old world where love is the way. When love is the way, unselfish, sacrificial, redemptive, imagine this tired old world when love is the way. When love is the way, then no child will go to bed hungry in this world ever again. When love is the way, we will let justice roll down like a mighty stream in righteousness like an ever-flowing brook. When love is the way, poverty will become history. When love is the way, the earth will be a sanctuary. When love is the way, we will lay down our swords and shields down by the riverside and study war no more. When love is the way, there is plenty good room, plenty good room for all of God's children, because when love is the way, we actually treat each other well. We are actually like family. When love is the way, we know that God is the source of us all, red and yellow, black and white. No matter what side of what line anybody may be on, because we are brothers and sisters, children of God. My brothers and sisters, that is a new heaven. That is a new earth. That is a new world, a new human family. Now that is the redemptive power of love. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, you have given us the command to love, and you have also put us on this planet with other people which seem to be contradictory because, Lord, you've made a few doozies and we don't get along with everybody and not everybody gets along with us and honestly, we may have enemies we don't know. There are those out there who who may hate us because we're a part of this group and there are those out there that think we hate them because we're a part of this group And this makes no sense because you were the perfect embodiment of love and you are the one we worship. Send us into this world with no other agenda but to love someone so powerfully that they can see you working through us in their lives. 
That's our mission. That's our vision. That's our strategy, to be carriers of the love into this world. And so whenever we see a lack of love in the world, we can tell that that is you calling us to go there and to love extravagantly. When we see those who are hurting, that is you calling us to go there and to love people to healing. When we see those who are alone and fearful, that is you calling us to go and love so that they may know that they are not alone. We have been called to do nothing in this world but love. Love you and love our neighbors. Forgive us, Lord, for accepting your love so powerfully and wonderfully and freely and for being so stingy with our own towards others. Release us from whatever keeps us from loving others so that everyone in this community may indeed know that Jesus Christ loves them because he loved us and it is oozing out of our pores. We ask all of this in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. M number 172, please. 172. May we stand. <clears throat> now as you go from this place receive this blessing upon your lives may the power of almighty god keep you safe from all harm may the glory that is our risen savior shine through you for all this world to see and may in every house my christ be your guest amen mm -hmm.